Welcome to the NWAETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unner, and I'd like to turn it over to our medical director, Dr. Brian Wood, to introduce our guest. Well, a big thank you to David Spock for doing another presentation for us. I think you guys all know David. He's PI for NWATC ECHO and professor of medicine here at the University of Washington. And I'll turn it over to David. Great, Brian. Thank you. Well, this is a timely topic since approximately three to four weeks ago, new recommendations and guidelines came out for occupational post-exposure prophylaxis. So this talk is really going to focus on an update on occupational post-exposure prophylaxis. Let me make two things clear. The new guidelines do not address non-occupational, such as sexual post-exposure prophylaxis, and the new guidelines only focus on HIV. They do not have any recommendations related to hepatitis B or hepatitis C post-exposure prophylaxis. The guidelines often come out in sort of CDC, MMWR type venues, and this one came out in Infection Control Hospital Epidemiology. And this was a little bit more under the radar, and not everyone heard about these guidelines when they came out several weeks ago. But this is the particular reference in how you can access these guidelines. Before launching into some of the specifics, let's step back and look at what we're talking about in terms of relative risk of exposures with different types of HIV exposures. And first of all, the estimated risk with a percutaneous exposure, such as, such as the classic needle stick injury in the thumb or the hand, this is a 0.3 risk of transmission without someone initiating post-exposure prophylaxis antiretroviral therapy. Mucous membrane exposures, such as a splash of blood in the eye or, or, or another mucous membrane in the mouth, would be about 0.09%. Non-intact skin exposures could occur, such as someone has severe eczema on their hands and a splash of blood goes on their hands. This risk is very hard to quantify. We know it's less than mucous membrane exposures, but it's not zero. So it is considered a significant exposure. Now, one of the questions that comes up, if you get specific questions regarding should I use post-exposure prophylaxis? It's important to know about all the different fluids in the body and what they are considered in terms of relative risk. Clearly, the top group, infectious fluids, blood, and visible body fluids, are really a no-brainer in terms of those are clearly post-exposure prophylaxis fluids that, that we deal with. The ones that are harder to know and, and counsel people about but are considered potentially infectious are things like semen and vaginal, vaginal secretions, cerebral spinal fluid, synovial fluid, pleural fluid, and so on. These clearly are not zero risk, but they're considered very low risk. Exposures that would not warrant post-exposure prophylaxis or when fluids such as saliva or vomitus or feces involved, nasal secretions, sputum, sweat and tears, and urine, unless these particular fluids are blood-stained or you can... Uh, and specifically see bloody fluid in them. So I think that's important because these are the kind of calls I get sometimes where somebody was splashed, you know, after somebody vomited and it went on their arm, should they get post-exposure prophylaxis? And that particular situation, vomiting on someone's intact skin clearly is a situation you would not give post-exposure prophylaxis. So to drill in now on the, the five issues that I want to address, there are these five issues. First of all, the issue of whether or not you should be using two or three drugs with occupational post-exposure prophylaxis with HIV. Uh, what is the new preferred regimen? Why we give 28 days of therapy and why you should actually really take the time to counsel the individuals that you see about completing that 28 days of therapy. And then really, very importantly, situations that really warrant expert consultation. What's out of the box that warrants either you getting a true expert involved or calling and getting expert advice from the hotline? And then the last is there are some slight revisions in the recommended lab follow-up. So just to clarify then, in terms of defining an at-risk exposure, it would be contact of blood, tissue, or other potentially infectious body fluids via a percutaneous injury, a mucous membrane exposure, or contact with non-intact skin, such as somebody who has you know, severe eczema on their hands or an open cut on their hand or arm, and, and there's an exposure. Okay, let's get an example here. This is a 41-year-old nurse who had a needle stick injury on his, left thumb, on his left thumb. 
The site bled for about two minutes after the injury. The source patient um, has documented HIV infection, has never taken antiretroviral medication, so ARV naive. And the most recent study showed a viral load of 2,350 and a CD4 count of 658. The healthcare worker appropriately washed the thumb off after the exposure for several minutes. And the question I'm asking you to think about for a second is based on these new guidelines, what's recommended here? Would it actually be, A would be zidovudine, lamivudine, combivir, B would be a two-drug regimen of tenofovir, imtricitabine, or Truvada, C would be tenofovir, imtricitabine, Truvada, plus raltegravir, or D, tenofovir, imtricitabine, Truvada, plus darunavir, which is prazista, plus ritonavir, or norvir. So if you're sitting here thinking, you may be going, okay, I, pr I probably like the three drug choices here, and probably either one of them are good. Well, indeed, probably both of those are very reasonable, but in the guidelines, what's recommended is actually going to be C, which is the Travada plus Raltegravir regimen. And let me point out, first of all, that in the new guidelines, our life will be easier. You do not have to go through complex tables and figure out, do you do two drugs or three drugs? Everybody gets three drugs. So if you pull the trigger, you get three drugs. That's the deal. Here's the quote that sums it up really well. As less toxic and better tolerated medications for the treatment of HIV infection are now available, minimizing the risk of PEP non-completion and the optimal number of medications needed for HIV PEP remain unknown. The PHS group, working group recommends prescribing three or more tolerable drugs as PEP for all occupational exposures to HIV. So I think that makes our life a lot simpler. I used to find the tables very complicated, very hard to sort out in my mind. Sometimes what's two drugs, what's three drugs. And about the last couple of years, I came around on my own sort of to just saying, hey, if I'm going to put somebody on therapy, I'm going to put them on three drugs because we know that's what we do for everybody with known HIV. Here's the specific regimen that's recommended, uh, raltegravir plus tenofovir and tricytabine. As you all know, this is really going to be a well-tolerated regimen. That's why it's chosen, and it's a low pill burden. And I think most healthcare workers for 28 days can take a twice-daily regimen. I think this is very reasonable. It's very well-tolerated. There are very few drug-drug interactions. The only situation where this could get complicated is if somebody has baseline renal insufficiency. And if in that case, then I think you go to some of the alternative regimens that's shown here. Here is a list in order of preference of alternatives. So, for example, if a person had renal insufficiency, you could use raltegravir on the left-hand column plus zidovudine plus lamivudine or combivir. So that would give you an option of somebody if the healthcare worker had renal insufficiency. Alternatively, if for some reason you didn't want to use raltegravir, you could use darunavir boosted with ritonavir, you could use etrovirin, you could use a number of other options that are chosen here. But I think, again, the rationale for raltegravir is the agent on that left-hand column is it's very well tolerated, which gives you a high likelihood the person will really complete the 28 days. And in general, it's very unlikely that most people are going to have uh, integrase resistance. Now, over time, that may change, and we may see these guidelines need to be modified as more integrase inhibitors are used. Now, the, the next issue to address is why 28 days? And everybody, I, I think, knows to give 28 days, but most people don't really know some of the science behind that. The epidemiological data was that when the New England Journal article was published years ago showing that zidovudine reduced the likelihood that you would get HIV by occupational exposure by about 80%, in general, most people took zidovudine or AZT for about a month. And that's where they came up with that in the first place. Then subsequently, some studies were done in macaques where they inoculated them with SIV. So that's what I'm going to show. There's basically six treatment arms here. And the idea is that all these macaques got inoculated with the HIV equivalent for these animals, which is SIV, and then they either gave them the medication 24 hours after the inoculation or it was delayed 48 to 72 hours. So you can see the six regimens there. They wait 24 hours, and they give them placebo, they wait 24 hours, they give them three days of therapy, 10 days of therapy, 28 days of therapy, or they delay the uh, initiation of therapy to 48 or 72 hours. Now, it goes without saying that with healthcare workers, we want them to get on therapy right away. So there's no reason 
that they should be delayed more than 24 hours. Indeed, we like people to get on therapy for post-exposure prophylaxis within four to six hours. But let's look what happened to these macaques. So they were all given tenofovir except the placebo group. So go into your far left, the green bar. If you got placebo, the, the macaque really didn't do well. All of them got SIV. If they got started 24 hours afterwards and they only got three days, they didn't do so good. If they got started 24 hours and they only got 10 days, they didn't do so good. But notice if they got 28 days, the middle bar there, none of them actually were infected with SIV. If you delayed a little bit, 48 hours or 72 hours, they did mediocre. 50% of them got infected. So the take-home point from this visual slide is very obvious. You want to start early and you want to take it for a full 28 days. And I think what we're really talking about is extrapolating from this study and saying what we're really doing with these animals is you're not truly preventing infection, you're aborting infection. And we actually think the same thing ha happens in humans after they're inoculated with, with a needle stick injury. There's probably a micro inoculation of the virus. And with our therapy, what we're probably doing is aborting therapy. And that's why you don't want to just abort with a two to three day treatment. You want to go and give the full 28 days to give the immune system time to clean up any cells that may have been infected at the time of the inoculation. So this may be the most, most important slide. And the issue is, when do you ask for help or do you need to educate people in your community when they need to ask for help with a needle stick injury? The first is if there's a delayed exposure. So, for example, someone was stuck with a needle. They didn't actually realize it was a high-risk exposure, and somebody identifies the patient as HIV infected five days later. That's a problem. Or they're talking to someone at a party, and they go, oh, geez, you know, I had this needle stick injury. And the person says, oh, no, you should have gotten medication for that. For example, this can happen, you know, out to, you know, four, five, six days after an exposure. So that warrants consultation. There's not a right answer. It should be taken case by case. If the source is unknown, the healthcare workers reaching in a needle stick bin, um, you know, putting a needle in and accidentally get stuck with another needle that's in there. Somebody's cleaning up laundry area and there's a needle in a sheet and they get stuck. That warrants consultation. If the, the individual um, that's exposed to healthcare worker is pregnant or possibly pregnant, you should get expert consultation. If the person's breastfeeding, if there is known or suspected antiretroviral drug resistance in the source patient, that's a potential problem. Serious medical illness in the exposed person, for example, underlying renal insufficiency, that could be an issue that warrants modification of all the drug dosing. The last would be is if a person is taking the medications and they're not tolerating them well, you don't just abandon ship, you get expert consultation, you get them on something that will be tolerated, or you work with them. For example, if they have a lot of nausea and vomiting, you can give them some medications to prevent the nausea and vomiting. If you need help and you don't have the person power to provide that expert consultation or it's after hours and you need a good resource, the 24-7 hotline um, through the National Clinicians Post-Exposure Prophylaxis Hotline is a wonderful resource. They are highly expert and they will walk you through any exposure and give you excellent advice. So, so my advice is that all the communities in your area uh, all of the communities should, should be given the information about this hotline and have access to it. The last practical issue is what about follow-up for your, your individual? So if your healthcare worker has a needle stick exposure, most people don't do this, but they should be seen within 72 hours. You want to make sure that you're reviewing their baseline labs that they got, their baseline HIV and hepatitis, hepatitis B and so on. And what you want to do at that point is make sure they're tolerating the medications well. Make sure they don't need something like ondansetron because they have severe nausea. The second thing is the baseline and follow-up labs are listed there. The key thing from the HIV testing is that you basically test them at baseline and then go 6, 12, 24 weeks after the exposure. Interestingly, if you use the new fourth generation assay, which we'll talk a little bit more about in another talk later. If you use this new assay, follow-up can be at 6 and 16 weeks. And the last thing is, is that you do want to get some baseline renal and hepatic tests and then do follow-up labs in two weeks. Okay, so one last question. 
Just a, just a little quiz for you to see what you would do with this one. A 32-year-old physician has a needle stick injury on her hand that involves an HIV-infected patient. The source patient is taking tenofovir, emtricitabine, efavirenz, atripla, doing great on that, has an undetectable viral load that was measured three months prior. So the question is, based on these new guidelines, would you recommend giving post-exposure prophylaxis in this setting? So undetectable viral load in the source patient, what do we do? The recommendation is as follows. Yes, you still go ahead and give it. Exposure to a source patient with an undetectable serum viral load does not eliminate the possibility of HIV transmission or the need for post-exposure prophylaxis and follow-up testing. While the risk of transmission from an occupational exposure to a source patient with an undetectable serum viral load is thought to be very low, PEP should still be offered. And the reason is, even though the serum viral load is negative, there can be latent virus in cells, and, and it, there have been cases of documented transmission sexually with people with undetectable viral loads and with maternal to child transmission. So because it's theoretically possible and because we know that giving post-exposure prophylaxis is, is in general going to be a very safe thing to do, it is recommended to do. Just to summarize then, 